Welcome to what is actually very bizarre Monday Dividend Cafe, just a uh, surreal weekend. And and in a lot of ways, there, you know, there's a lot of market activity going on and there's all the stuff that um, I normally talk about and we're going to talk about it. And and there's no reason not to, right? I mean, the, the assassination attempt on Saturday failed. And so in one sense, it's kind of like, okay, there's a lot of normalcy. We can just talk about bonds and yields and all that. But like, I'm still struggling with the fact that it was that you're you're talking about a a centimeter away from it, not being normal, from it being this um, national situation that is really in a lot of ways kind of unthinkable. And so the, the political moment, the Republican convention starting tonight, Today, President Trump, former President Trump, announced his selection of current Ohio Senator J.D. Vance to be his running mate to run as vice president along with uh, former President Trump as they seek the uh, White House in November. Polling data, betting odds and things like that are pointing to that being a uh, much more probable outcome than many would have guessed. Um, the current president Biden is dealing with a lot of mutiny efforts within his own party and own infrastructure, their, their donor base, Hollywood, um, other key figures in the democratic establishment, um, that seems to have tapered down to some degree, the betting odds for whatever they're worth have picked back up to, uh, a, a much higher assumption that president Biden will end up being the candidate. Um, some people may think that's a good thing. Some may think it's a bad thing. Um, you know, what's interesting is some who are not Biden supporters may think it's a good thing because they believe he's more beatable. Others may feel differently. There, there's all kinds of, of different ways to go about looking at this. From a market standpoint, the presidential election outcome has implications in U.S.-China relations. Uh, U.S.-China relations has implications when it comes to foreign trade with U.S.-India relations. Uh, emerging markets investors have a lot of skin in the game on those topics. Uh, all investors, U.S.-centric, uh, are, are exposed to the regulatory environment, the tax environment. There's a certain part of the 2017 tax bill that sunsets at the end of 2025, a year and a half from now. Not all of it does, but a good portion of it does. And so therefore would require an extension from who's ever in power at that time. So international, domestic, tax, regulatory, uh, energy policy, I think sticks out primarily, you know, it's on my radar because of our um, heavy focus in the energy sector as investors at the Bonson Group, uh, particularly around LNG, liquefied natural gas, and some of the regulatory uh, impediments that have been in place in the current administration. So there, there, there's a lot to think about with that. And yet then also from the vantage point of the country, um, I don't care how much somebody dislikes President Trump. There are um, Republicans like me who have really never been um, a big fan. There are Democrats that can't stand them. There's, you know, a lot of strong emotions for and against uh, uh, Donald Trump, obviously. But nobody could possibly want to be in a country where um, a significant leader, let alone a president, let alone a former president, uh, could have a bullet uh, nick their ear um, and miss running right through their head um, on national television. And so it's a surreal moment and it's sobering. And I hope that a lot of the rhetoric calms down and markets have taken it in stride, but I don't know what markets would have done with another centimeter of movement. Um we need to talk about markets, but I just want to put that on the table that we're sitting here in the middle of July. The Republican convention starts tonight. The VP was just announced today. So there's a long way to go. 
a week or two ago, there was all the drama about who the candidate would even be on the Democrat side. So I, I just suspect we're in for a weird few months. It's already been a very weird few weeks, and I don't think that's letting up anytime soon. And um, we, I'll leave it there. The Dow today was up over 200 points, closed at an all-time high, by the way, up a little over a half of a percentage point. S&P was up a quarter of a point. The NASDAQ was up 40 basis points. Um, the market breadth substantially improved last week. You probably had one of the biggest weeks you've had in a while with the even-weighted index playing catch-up with the cap-weighted index. Still a long way to go in that record-high delta. Um, Generally, when you get to a place where the uh, leadership is so narrow that the cap-weighted index is outperforming the even-weighted index by that much, how does it normally resolve itself? Some would say, well, the laggards can catch up to the leaders. And mathematically, that is true. That is not generally how it happens. Generally, the um, overvalued components have to decline in addition to the undervalued components repricing. Uh, so, you know, there's mathematical possibility, but there's also historical uh, tendency. We'll see what happens here. The, the Russell 2000, the small cap index, was up another 1.8% today, but it's up almost 8% since last Monday in the last week. So a really substantial rally in our small cap sector, not just the total sector itself, but the uh, breadth within it, 64% of the companies in the Russell 2000 are now above their own 200-day moving average. It's quite substantial. In the bond market, the 230 spread, so the two-year yield and the 30-year yield, is uninverted for the first time in over two years. Um, it's it's pretty much just sort of flat. I think they're each at about a 4.5% yield. The two tens, which is the more traditional spread metric, has not uninverted yet. It has a ways to go, but um, it, it's all steepening slowly but, but surely, and, and we'll, we'll get there at some point in time. 230s uh, kicked it off today. Um, energy was top performing sector today, up one and a half, over 1.5%. Financials were up almost 1.5%. And then the worst performing sector was utilities. They were down 2.39%. So, you know, it's funny. I mean, I'm sitting here talking about because the assassination attempt is one of the biggest stories in a long, long time. Uh, and I totally forget to mention that a federal judge threw out the, uh, one of the substantial cases against President Trump today dealing with the classified documents. Um, that, tr that case was not likely to go to trial before November anyways. Um, Legally speaking, I suspect it was the strongest case relative to some of the others, and yet um, uh, the the judge today has totally thrown it out on the basis of it being a violation of the appointments clause. And there's some legalese in there that that you know you can look at yourself uh, whether you're a lawyer or not a lawyer, form your own opinion. But that's a story that let's put it this way: normally would have been the biggest story of the week. And it made like my fourth story here today. Um, okay, economically, consumer confidence fell on Friday. I don't really care. Uh, never have, never will. Uh, there's a chart at DividendCafe.com straight from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, a client had pointed it out to me. I had not seen it. I was blown away, and I want to share it with you. I circled a few things in the chart, but you have to go to DividendCafe.com to see what full-time workers who work from uh, their, their employer location, some outside workplace, generally an office, what they are reporting for hours worked in a day versus what those who are self-declared, what they're working in a day in work from home. It's a fascinating, actually governmental reported survey at the BLS website. Uh, foreclosures, um, by the way, the Adam report came out last week for the middle of the year. Uh, we're at 177,000 either foreclosures or default notices. And a lot of default notices do not go all the way to foreclosure. Um, but it, that number of 177,000 in the first half of the year is down 4.5%. 
from what it was in the first half of last year, uh, but it's an 8% increase over what it was in the first half of 2022, but nobody was defaulting in 2022 just based on you know uh, where markets were at the time and, and and anyone who was in a position after default was probably in a better position to just sell. Um, so the uh, New Jersey and Illinois have the highest foreclosure rate in the country, but it's 0.21%. So it's a high rate, uh, relatively speaking, but a very low rate, absolutely speaking. The highest growth in foreclosures year over year is Kentucky. They're up 73%, but you're talking about a 73% increase from a very low number to a still very low number. So just want to put all that data out there. Speaking of numbers, 88% chance of a Fed rate cut in September, 100% now priced in the futures market for November. Um, so there we go. Uh, oil today closed to $82. Midstream companies have begun reporting. They were up again, another 1% last week. Uh, against doomsdayism, I finished this series we'd gone through of the seven laws of pessimism. And now today, I wanted to share from a Goldman Sachs research report, um, 60% of workers today are employed in occupations that did not exist in 1940. So another way to put it is that 85% of the employment growth, 85% of the employment growth over the last 80 years has been driven by um, technology-driven creation, innovations in totally new occupations. I think that's, I, if someone's able to interpret that somehow as a negative, if someone's able to not see in that the overwhelming positive, then they have to explain it to me. Thoughtful question from Ask TBG, and we're going to close out with this. Uh, someone saying, I know you don't subscribe to the theory the money supply is the sole driver of inflation, that you don't believe in the MV equals PT and whatnot, but I'm curious on your idea and what your take is on the idea of a monetary rule to constrain inflation. Would you think binding Fed monetary policy to some measure of economic growth targeting nominal GDP would help prevent wild inflationary cycles? And the reason why I had to print that is because the premise in it um, – is is completely untrue that I do not believe that inflation is a monetary phenomena. I always have believed inflation is a monetary phenomena, but like Milton Friedman, I believe it is when there is too much money chasing too few goods. And so therefore the supply side of the economy is half of that equation. I very much believe MV equals PT, which is Irving Fisher's equation theory that money supply times velocity equals the price level times the supply, total amount of transactions. And that's a, a, a tautology, an, a, an, an equation uh, that helps us calculate where money supply fits in to the price level. But, but see, that M is one of the variables, the M of money supply that helps involve solving for the P, which is the price level, or whether or not you have inflation. It isn't the only one, though. So it isn't that I don't agree with the money, uh, the uh, uh, quantity theory of money. It's that I do agree with it. And it itself says that velocity matters and that the supply of goods and services matter. And so, therefore, there are other variables that play in. Now, that's one thing I just want to clarify because I can't even comp, I just couldn't sleep at night. I care so much about this issue. I've devoted so much of my own study and writing to this that if I've given anyone the impression that I don't believe in the quantity theory of money, we have a major problem. However, um, to the, the person's question, I don't know if nominal GDP targeting would necessarily prevent any uh, possibility of, of inflationary cycles. I certainly believe that some rules-based approach with monetary policy is superior to not having a rules-based approach that is highly discretionary and, and highly interventionist. Um, but that isn't necessarily just about the inflationary outcomes. It also speaks to the distortion 
of um, economic signals. It speaks to the misallocation of resources, including the resource of capital. That when uh, Fed policy is not rules-based, is too arbitrary, too discretionary, and we distort economic signals, price discovery, and so forth, that we almost assure ourselves of malinvestment that has to be purged out and, and suboptimal resource allocation that limits economic growth. That's my biggest basis for um, advocating for rules-based approach. And it's less focused on its impact on the price level, but I don't deny that there could very well be a benefit there as well. Great question, long answer, I'm sorry. Um, I'm gonna leave it there. You have the Republican convention this week. You have a, uh, a weekly portfolio holdings report coming on Wednesday. Um, we'll have our normal questions and what's on David and Brian's mind each day this week, the podcast, all the fun things, and then a heck of a lot going on earnings season. So our whole investment committee is very, very busy dealing with analysts and, and co company outcomes and uh, certain po potential portfolio adjustments. Uh, so all that to say, reach out with your questions because I sure love answering them. Have a wonderful Monday night and God bless America. Mm -hmm.